Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Construction Business Management. We're going to be looking today at Module 1A and we're going to be discussing entrepreneurship. In this uh, today's topic, we're going to be looking at um, both entrepreneurship and change. How change provides us with opportunities to innovate, to create, to start businesses. We'll also do a little discussion that distinguishes between being an entrepreneur and an intrapreneur. So these will be the topical areas for today's section. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines entrepreneur as one who organizes, manages, and assumes the risk of a business or enterprise. So that is really saying manages, okay, we kind of get that idea, organizes. What a big one here is assumes the risk of a business or enterprise. What that's really saying is an entrepreneur has skin in the game. They have some of their own capital in the game. And usually uh, the thought of what an entrepreneur is, is, you know, it's synonymous with the founder who started this business. You know, you kind of think about the McDonald's brothers and Ray Kroc when you think about McDonald's. And there's lots of stories there if you ever watch the movie with uh, Michael Keaton. Uh, but and who is the actual founder and who kind of ended up with the business. So there's lots of uh, interesting things in that, that movie, let's just say. Uh, business entrepreneurs are often betting on themselves. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the course, but there's what we call return on investment. And, you know, you have a certain amount of capital. Maybe you've got $100,000 and you're looking at, well, I could put this in the bank. I could get this very small amount of interest, like today, right now, it'd probably be about 0.1 of 1%. I'm sure I'd get it, uh, but uh, it's not very much, and actually inflation will eat away at that. Or I could put it in the stock market. Mm, stock market could be pretty good. It could be 10%, it could be 20%, it could be 30%, but it could also be 0%, minus 10%, minus 20%, minus 30%, or more depending how long you keep it in there and what you invest it in. Well, some of these individuals will think, well, you know what? I have an idea. I have an idea and I'm going to bet on myself because I think this idea is a really good idea and I think I can do it better than others and have a competitive advantage. So entrepreneurs generally are willing to bet on themselves. Uh, business entrepreneurs, from a governmental point of view, are considered very important to the economy. You know, when we talk about small business, there's more small businesses in Canada and North America and in the world than there are big businesses. But we hear a lot about the big businesses, but government acknowledges and knows uh, the value that that contributes to society. So it's a very in fundamentally important part of the economy. It's also where we do a lot of our innovation and creations. Entrepreneurship is often difficult as many new ventures fail, right? This is very true. A lot of new ventures fail. There's different statistics out there. You know, most businesses will fail in the first five years. Uh, you look at restaurants, uh, you look at some of the things that have gone on, uh, like the financial crisis of 2008 and how that affected businesses. Uh, you look at housing business in the United States was dramatically impacted by uh, the financial crisis of 2008. Canada wasn't as uh, negatively impacted. There was a bunch of different confluent events that were going on and there were some differentiations that were also going on between the marketplaces. Uh, but definitely, you know, there is a lot of um, difficulty in those areas if you're not careful, right? So it can be can be kind of treacherous waters at uh, different times for um, new businesses. And you can think about the recent pandemic and the impacts that the pandemic had on certain types of businesses. You could only imagine if you opened the gym or you had a restaurant. These are risks that entrepreneurs take and they don't always have clear identification of what those risks are. Um, so an entrepreneur can be an agent who buys supplies at certain prices in order to combine them into a product with a view to selling it at uncertain prices in the future. For example, a developer, you're going to buy a property, maybe it's got an existing house on it, you're gonna tear that house down, you're gonna put something new on it, build a new product, 
And then you're really speculating that this change that you're going to create on this property is going to be worth more. The combination of the property and the materials and the effort that goes in to build it is also going to leave room for a profit, a return on that investment that you're putting into it and a profit. And there, we'll explain later in the course how you have to look at them a little bit differently. Uh, how profit will come in through an income statement. Return on investment, we have to really look at, well, how much of our own money did we put in and what did we get back out of it? Entrepreneurs can be categorized as decision makers who improvise solutions and problems which cannot be solved by routine alone. This typically involves the taking on of risk and the application of a multitude of skills. And we can look at entrepreneurship differently in different uh, types of businesses. If you're really being creative and innovative, that is being an entrepreneur. If you're kind of doing a cookie uh, cutter kind of uh, event and it's kind of like, it's almost like a job and it's not involving much creativity and it's not, it's making you a living, but it's not really going beyond that. You, we can have debates about whether that's really being an entrepreneur, right? Um, chief cook and bottle washer syndrome that I kind of like to call it uh, when you're an entrepreneur. When you're starting out, you really are the chief cook and bottle washer. You're going to be doing the estimate if in a construction related business. You're going to be doing the estimating. You're going to be doing the pricing and the, the sales. You're going to be doing the procurements for your subcontractors. You're going to be building the relationships. If you're small enough, you might even be doing the physical work yourself. So it just depends what you are doing. Uh, with that particular business. But until you really get it ramped up, there tends to be more roles that you end up playing. And in fact, if you don't really develop the tools to be able to delegate and hire certain parts out, then you'll be kind of confined and stuck to a certain size. Um, that's another thing that happens very often to small business owners. So what is the difference between entrepreneur and an intrapreneur? I'm generally, when I do this class uh, live, I'm used to um, asking this question and it always strikes me that not that many people have heard of intrapreneur. Uh, in fact, when you Google it, you know, it always, it always says, did you type it wrong? Uh, did you want entrepreneur? Uh, but intrapreneur is a word. Uh, it defines somebody that works in the business, right? For basically somebody else. So you're an employee if you're an entrepreneur. Really, you don't have skin in the game. You don't have your own money in the business. You don't own that business or part of that business. But you know what? You're creative, you're innovative, you're driven. Uh, every business owner wants to have entrepreneurs that work for them because they're excited about what they do they're passionate it doesn't take much to motivate them they're already driven and already motivated uh, but uh, it's different than an entrepreneur an entrepreneur has their own money at risk so you want to really think about this we're talking about a course on construction business management construction business management and con the construction industry, you know, you can start a small, handy person kind of uh, business and not take too much investment to start it out. But if we're talking about doing larger commercial projects or even, you know, even projects that are four or five hundred thousand dollars, smaller kind of projects, you have to have a certain amount of your capital involved because there is a whole bunch of things that go on when you're doing work. You have to have money to pay your employees. You have to have money to pay your subcontractors and you may not get the money from the client exactly at the timing you need it. So you're gonna need some lines of credit, some liquidity, cash that you can pay this out till you get the money in. And if you don't have that, then you will be stopped at any particular point in time. So entrepreneurship, you're taking on those risks. And in fact, very, very likely you thrive on those kind of risks. Whereas entrepreneur, you probably don't like those kind of risks, but you like doing creative things and you're really driven, but maybe you have a little bit, uh, you're a little bit what we call risk averse. Uh, I think about myself, I ran a family run construction business. I grew up in this family run construction business uh, and I ran it for a number of years. And I had this opportunity to teach at um, the college. And one of the things that uh, I appreciated about the college was uh, you didn't really have to put your own money into it, right? It's a job. 
Uh, but at the same time, I kind of like to think like an entrepreneur. So when I was at the college, I kind of thought at the beginning like an entrepreneur. And so I created new programs and got uh, wrote them up, got them approved by the ministry, uh, went out trying to sell and bring in uh, students. Uh, it was called the Building Renovation Program. And it's, it's quite a large program now at the college. Uh, when I stopped coordinating and it, it had around 300 students. Uh, so it became, I felt very good about that and I was very driven about that. Whereas entrepreneur, it's different. Entrepreneur, you're going out there and you need to get those clients because if you don't, you've got certain overheads that you have to pay for. And if you're not bringing in money, then those overheads, they're eating away at whatever capital you invested in the business, which might be your family's life savings. And if you're not very successful at this, it can whittle away or it can be gone uh, pretty quickly. But on the same time, same token, if you're very creative and enterprising, you can take that investment money and multiply it many times over. So that's the, that's the attraction in entrepreneurship. Also, you don't have a boss in particular. You have clients, and we'll talk about client relations and the importance of client relations in this course. You have clients that, that you need and that they are basically telling you what you need to do and you've agreed in a contract but nobody's micromanaging what you do necessarily. So there are people that they really are attracted to entrepreneurship for those very, very reasons. So there's pluses and minuses in there, and we'll get into that throughout the course. But really, to distinguish, entrepreneurs uh, are, t are very successful, by the way, uh, working within their businesses that they're work working in or they're very respected, uh, not difficult for them to get another job if something happens with those businesses because they are very good at what they do. Um, that is something that is with an entrepreneur, but they're not making multiple times. They don't typically have that opportunity unless, of course, you become, you know, you work your way up in an internal labor market within a larger organization. So if you took like the construction industry and you took some big companies, uh, and I'm just to, to name a few, you know, like an Ellis Dawn, a PCL, a Turner Construction. Uh, if you took some of those and you started off at a very low level and you, you were very entrepreneurially and you worked really well in those businesses, you know, you could start out as a project coordinator and become an assistant project manager and a project manager and a construction manager and a vice president and eventually CEO. Yeah, then you're going to make a, a lot. But still... The CEO of a publicly traded large construction company is not going to make the same kind of money as a very large privately owned con owner of that construction industry. So there's a little bit of a, a difference there. But at a certain point, what, what does it really matter, right? Um, but just putting those out there, I think it's worth you thinking about uh, when we talk about construction business management and business management in general, by the way. So what, why does someone become an entrepreneur? Well, for those reasons that I, I was saying, um, uh, you know, uh, sometimes people get forced into it. You know, the economy drops and they're out of work and they're pretty creative and they're not going to sit uh, waiting for the economy to improve and they start something out of nothing. And so that can start people. Uh, lack of opportunities or limitations to grow within an existing business. You're there but there doesn't seem the op there's not a good what we call internal labor market for you to be able to move up like the previous example I gave. You have this burning passion, this real um, drive to um, uh, improve and to to you got an idea. You really want to push it forward, uh, or a problem that really annoys the person until they see a solution. Sometimes this is a big driver for people. They get into a corner and they see this problem that really annoys them and. They actually visualize a solution to it. Uh, you could, you know, you can look at some of the great, uh, the great CEOs of the past and founders of the past. A lot of times, they may see a problem and uh, then they see the solution to the problem, and then they're just really attracted to that and driven, totally uh, possessed by that uh, particular um, idea. I think of uh, this example, and you know what I'm. I've taught for many years and I, I kind of get a little bit careful about telling a story because I find sometimes when there's a story, it might not be 100% true, uh, especially quotes too, by the way. So if I, if I have a quote and it doesn't seem to, 
you know, you can find something on it. Um, I'm just qualifying right now that there there can be things on this. Uh, I think I think Netflix itself has a has a, a thing out on Blockbuster uh, right now. So, and I've heard both founders, uh, Reed Hastings, and uh, I think his other name, the other founder is um, Randolph, is his last name, I believe. Uh, tell kind of different stories to this. So um, uh, where the truth is, I'm not exactly sure. But this this is actually a story unto itself. So I like to um, identify it and explain it. Uh, Netflix was started in 1997 as a DVD uh, mail, uh, mail order company. And really, um, the other founder wanted to, uh, originally they looked at using VHS tapes and it would have been too expensive in the mail. All of a sudden when DVDs became the new technology, change in the technology, then it would fit in an envelope and they could use regular postage. That was a big advantage all of a sudden at that time period. But Reed Hastings used this um, story and I think it, you know what? I think he kind of invented it somewhat to really get a story behind um, Netflix. So he said uh, the founder was forced to pay $40 in late fees for renting the Apollo 13 DVD well past its due date. Um, not sure, as I said, if it's exactly true, uh, but it definitely makes for a good story. And you know what? It is true. Like uh, many of you are too young to remember, uh, perhaps, but uh, my daughter worked at Blockbuster and it was the place like you went and you got DVDs or you got VHS tapes when it started. And it was well established, multi-billion dollar business um, at that time. And they had a good business model in their minds because they would get a lot of money in late fees. And it was something they had a name for it, something like the dissatisfaction uh, revenue or something like that. Well, when you're making money off the dissatisfaction of your clients, it might be a good business model for a period of time, but you got a lot of dissatisfied clients that'll be more than happy to go to somebody else. Think about it in the construction industry. If you've got a lot of dissatisfied clients, it is not easy to run a construction business on the long term. Fully 80% of most construction companies' clients are repeat clients. You don't wanna go looking for new clients every time for every project. That is a difficult way to, very, very difficult uphill way to be successful in this business. Much better to have happy clients, satisfied clients, and that will help to um, repeat business. Uh, there's a book called Raving Fans, and that's what you want. You want clients that are fans of yours, that they will tell their friends about you that they will tell other clients about you. If you're in the commercial sector and you're a properties management team, that these property managers will tell other property managers about you. It is a way to grow your business. Uh, having dissatisfied clients and putting a fee on that, not the best way. Uh, so that was one of the ways that uh, Netflix uh, kind of, they didn't have that late fee aspect. I forget the exact uh, model they had, but if you, you wouldn't get a new movie till you return the old movie, let's say it was something like that. So everybody always wants a new movie, so they would return the old movie. Maybe it wasn't within exactly the time period, so there was a bit of a, uh, a cost-benefit analysis in there, but it was a very attractive business model. And it's very interesting if you listen to the founders on their discussions about that. At one point, Amazon wanted to buy them out. This is in the early days even of Amazon, but they were already kind of taking off because Amazon had a business model. What they wanted to do originally was to sell books, but then very quickly it expanded, right, to be to sell everything to consumers. Uh, and so they were looking at um, that aspect. Um, but... Who was the loser in this in this process? Well, it was it wasn't Netflix, right? Because some of you that I'm talking to, you know, what blockbuster? I've heard of that, but I don't remember it. Um, and so, how might things have been different? Well, you have to change as a business. You had this great uh, um, upfront start like Blockbuster had, uh, but you also have to be able to respond to changes in the marketplace. If you're not able to adapt, pivot be agile, you're going to be left behind. And you know what? The construction industry is on the verge of massive change. We have been a laggard in change for decades, and now uh, we're on a tipping point. There's a lot of technology that have, 
advanced far enough that we can now utilize them in many different avenues uh, from building information modeling to scanning technologies to lean construction methodologies to integrated project delivery uh, uh, type uh, contracts um, to uh, better data uh, reconciliation and management such as earned value analysis. There's a lot of things and a lot of opportunities that are kind of on the converging that also leads to more prefabrication, off-site work, shorter assembly times. So there's all these opportunities out there for construction business management. Uh, so of course, in my example here, the loser was um, Blockbuster at the time. And I, like I said, I think there's a Netflix uh, uh, video that's kind of saying, no, this wasn't um, the case. But sooner or later, it was the case. Uh, Netflix actually ran into trouble during that 2008 financial crisis that I mentioned earlier on. And uh, they actually went to Blockbuster to try to see if they could broker a deal where they would buy them out. And Blockbuster really wasn't interested. So they kind of missed that huge opportunity. They were going to try, I think, to build it from the ground up. Uh, but at that point, you know, there was a kind of a dissatisfaction in the public in general with all these late fees. There was the Netflix was really growing rapidly with subscriptions. They had a liquidity problem though at that time. So that's where we'll talk later in the course when we talk about financial statements and understanding a little bit about cash flow and liquidity and understanding that and projects in construction take massive amounts of cash and liquidity, making sure we have enough money coming in to pay the money going out. And if we don't, making sure that we have a big enough uh, line of credit or financing, cash, liquidity in place to be able to fill those gaps. So this is kind of important uh, to be thinking about when we think about uh, um, running a business and what it takes and change that's occurring in those businesses. You know what? Teaching. You're watching this online. Uh, teaching really hadn't changed in 200 years right? Uh, classroom model, and it's got a whole history onto itself. So I don't want to take up too much time here on that. But all I can say is the way that we've been doing education really hasn't changed. I think the recent pandemic uh, will catapult that change, but it's been already happening. It's already been happening over the last uh, 10, 15, uh, 20 years. And now the technology is here where it's pretty easy to do. And people like yourselves, you want flexibility. And you know what? You need flexibility because there's so much change going on. You need to be able to have access to education more easily. So again, that is changing the way we do things as well. So if anything, after this particular module, I want you to start thinking about businesses and how they're operating and how things are changing as we speak. And we're going to take a little look at change and the historical change and how that's impacted things and now how things are speeding up. Jack Welch, the former CEO of GE, um, he had this uh, uh, comment that stated that to be successful, an entrepreneur, you better have an idea. You better have an idea. You better have a concept. You better have a vision. And that idea better be a good one because you're betting on it, right? Uh, and so you want to make sure that you've vetted it well. So when we talk about business plans later in the course, it's really twofold. Business plan be, can be to get a uh, line of credit, to get loans, to get venture capitalists, can be used for a bunch of different avenues, but it can also be used to help you crystallize better your idea. And no plan will ever go the way that you think it's going to go. As Eisenhower said, uh, famously said, uh, Eisen, General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower led the Allied troops in World War II um, to victory. Um, said, plans are nothing. Planning is everything. So you develop a plan, things go sideways on you, but you've got to have a plan so you can redirect, you can adjust, you can pivot. You can also determine if we're going to deviate from that plan or change that plan. And we're talking about business development based on the opportunities that come up. But if you don't have a plan, you're kind of just like floating around in the ocean not going anywhere, or you don't even know where you're going. Occasionally, somebody hits it. You know, they hit the island, but most of the time, they just disappear in the ocean. 
So we're going to stress the ideas, uh, good ideas that we, uh, as we go move through the course. And I want you to be thinking about things in that way. You know what? Even if you never plan to start a business, you're going to be working with somebody that is an entrepreneur or somebody for a company that you know somebody who runs that company. Well, then you can start thinking like an entrepreneur. So a lot of the things that we're going to be discussing fit right into that model as, as well. So no matter where you sit in the spectrum, there's opportunities through this course for you to think in those ways. All right. So, um, you know, when we think about two um, uh, uh, businesses, we have to think about um, the different types of business ownership too. So in part two, we're going to look at the different types of business ownership. So you can start thinking about um, the different types. We've got uh, sole proprietorship, we've got corporation, and we've got partnership. But we're going to return to that in part two, module 1B, as I'll call it. So I think about change, and there's this quote by Stephen Covey here. Management is efficiency in climbing the ladder of success. Leadership determines whether the ladder is leaning against the right wall. Uh, Stephen Covey wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And we got to ask the question, or I have to ask the question, why might someone be resistant to change? Why do you think there's people that are resistant to change? Well, some of the reasons that I can think of, and you know what, the younger you are, probably the less resistant to change you are. So depends on somewhat on your age. Uh, but somebody that's been in their job 15 years and the company wants to change software, probably not thrilled about it. Why? Because they're already very good at whatever software is currently being used and they got to learn something new. So there's going to be that resistance. Or if you're a tradesperson and you're really good with a certain type of material and all of a sudden there's been a new innovation and we're not going to use that material anymore. That's a big change and changes happen throughout in construction. You know, there used to be plasterers that used to plaster walls and then they invented drywall and then it became a taper, but it didn't require the same kind of skill sets that a plasterer did, but it still required a certain amount of skill sets um, to be very good at that. Uh, so things change and materials change and somebody that's really good at one thing is really resistant uh, because they work very hard to get where they are and they don't want to have to come, it's kind of like you crawled so far up the ladder of success and now things are changing. You got to come back down so that you can go up further, right? Uh, so that becomes a, a resistant aspect that people don't always respond uh, well to is that coming down of the rungs before being able to go up higher, right? So that's why people are in general resistant. Uh, some of the reasons why there's multitude of uh, reasons, but generally because it takes, people can be very complacent they get into a job, they use, you know, most students, they graduate and they improve a lot the first two or three years, and then it kind of tapers off and then they don't really improve too much. And then 20 years later or 15 years later, when they're obsolete in their jobs, they wonder why they got laid off. You want to be learning constantly because that is the way the world is now working. And if you're going to be a um, entrepreneur, you really have to be thinking outside the box. And I just want to point out a few things here. Um, you see this image here and I want, maybe I'll give you a minute just to look at that image. And what do you see? I see a lot of chaos. I see a lot of people, I see um, some new technologies because this was taken in 1908 in downtown Chicago. So I see, uh, you know, electric streetcars. So they have electricity. Um, I see some vehicles. I see horse and buggies. Right. What don't you see? What don't you see? I don't see any streetlights. I don't see any streetlights. You know what? 
apparently well street lights they you know the first one might have been invented around that time but from what i i looked up it really they didn't become into widespread use till about 1913. so here you got these things these innovations that are all coming about and you really don't know how to control them and this is about 112 years ago 113 114 years ago depending where we're at um, and you can see that um, in the trail there, right? So didn't have that technology. Well, you no, know, if we think about technology and the rate of change, a thousand years ago, it'd take a hundred years or more for the world to feel dramatically different. That means, you know, if you were, if you were uh, in the year 1000 uh, or 1050, you wouldn't see much difference in the technology. Life from one century to the next wasn't radically different. You know, with the Industrial Revolution, I, I love history and the Industrial Revolution. Um, when it began, then you, it started to speed up a bit, started to speed up. And by the end of the 19th century, the late 1800s, things really started to speed up compared to what they were 500 years before or even 200 years before because uh, technology started to take off. At the turn of the century, it was an exciting time. You know, we were starting to build... Uh, hydroelectric dams and we were starting to get Edison with the light bulbs in the late 1800s and then we were starting to get motor vehicles uh, then the Wright brothers in the early 1900s uh, first flight uh, so you could start to see all these different technologies all starting to come out it was a very exciting time very exciting time uh, and you know uh, it started to be what happened then is technology started to be built on technology as we went through the century and so what happened was things started to ramp up fairly quickly. Uh, and there's this saying, we stand on the shoulders of those before us, or we stand on the shoulders of others. And this is true, but it even becomes even more um, rampant when we stand on the shoulders of others and we have technology to help support us, all right? So all the stuff that's been invented and the data, and we're starting to get this explosion of data we can utilize. And we have this convergence of uh, mobile devices and broadband connectivity and cloud computing and, you know, AI and self-driving cars and all of these technologies uh, on the threshold of coming to uh, reality. Uh, so um, a lot of things is happening. And, you know, I can remember when the first student showed me their cell phone. Uh, his name was Rob and he kind of said, oh, Mr. Stevens, look at this uh, uh, Apple uh, cell phone and I thought it was like this marvelous thing looking at it and I remember within about four years you couldn't get anybody's attention because their heads were all glued to this device right it really changed the way that we do things in a very short period of time you may not realize it depending again on your age but it that was a really um, short period of time I remember I was traveling in um, I was in uh, London and I was uh, near, right near um, uh, the um, Big Ben and I was, I was marveling by the stone and looking at all the structure and everything and I looked around me and there were all these people and they weren't even looking at anything, they were just looking at, and there were tourists looking at their cell phones, right? <laughs> so they were missing a lot of that, what was going on, but really the amount of change that's taken place. So we have, uh, this change has affected companies, it's affected governments, and it's affected people. Uh, you can just think about uh, taxis, right? Uh, they got all upset with uh, Uber and Lyft, uh, ride-hailing uh, uh, vehicles, uh, how that changed. And here they are, they're, they're, they're having protests and trying to stop it. Well, you know what? It's very, very difficult to stop technology. In the Industrial Revolution, look up the Luddites. They tried to stop, uh, basically, some of the innovations that were going on then. They weren't very successful. Uh, so it's very, very difficult to slow that down. And not only that, governments don't even know what to do with it. You know, uh, Uber was already in the city of Toronto. And then, all of a sudden, the politicians were, well, this isn't right, because we get, like, you know, multi hundred thousand dollar fees for licenses for taxis and Uber's just starting this ride hailing uh, um, business and it's disrupting the taxi business. And then they tried to put in some laws, but then already everybody was using Uber and then basically the public was getting upset because they liked it. It's fast, it's easy, it, you don't wait, you know where your ride is, you know all these different things. It makes moving around so much more easy. 
And so governments had to back off because if they went down that road, they might lose votes. So these things come into play, but you can imagine the opportunities that these kind of changes take place. And I'm pointing these things out to you so you have a better understanding when you're starting a business, you better have a little bit of understanding and background of the complexities of the environment that you're starting this business in and have a good idea where you want to take this business with a good understanding of the things that are going on outside of it and being ready to adapt and be flexible when it's required. Doesn't mean you go jumping at the first shiny object. You have to be pretty, um, pretty critical of what you're reviewing, but it does mean you have to be attuned to the changes that are taking place. Uh, when we started, when I started in the construction business, every contractor had what they called a purlies. It was a company that made these maps. You could open them up, look at the street. It would have all the coordinates, and it was updated every year with all the new streets because we build new subdivisions, we put in new streets, and so it was constantly being updated every year. And so they had a good business because it would keep revolving over and over again. Uh, of course, that business kind of went by the wayside with uh, our GPS. We had our GPS, our portable GPS, and you stick it on the window and you buy a GPS. And it was great for a very short period of time because what happened was, well, we can just put the GPS in a cell phone. Now everybody's got a GPS. And not only that, it updates the maps daily. Uh, this one, you got to download the maps uh, and you got to have internet access and it's extra steps and you got to pay money for it. This one is just doing it and it's live and it's done and it shows you traffic. These ones, the newer ones do show you traffic, but they're not selling like this is because it's a phone. It does a million other things as well. Uh, so you have changes in technology and there's winners and there's losers in that, right? And so sometimes companies can even help to innovate their own demise. When we were in construction, one of our biggest clients was Kodak. They had this huge plant uh, in Toronto at Eglinton and between Keele and Old Western Road. Uh, right now, it's going to be a rail station. It's been repurposed. Highest and best use, the way a developer thinks. Highest and best use for a property. It's been redeveloped. It's been purchased. And it's going to be uh, basically a storage area for uh, all of the LRTs that are being built in the Eglinton Crosstown LRT system. Uh, but... Few people know that this guy actually invented the first digital camera. He worked for Kodak. Uh, this is from a book called uh, Bold. I, I might get it mixed up. Bold or Abundance uh, by Peter Diamantes. Um, I think he wrote both. But anyways, um, basically, first, first digital camera. But they didn't really invest in it. And you know what? When I was running the family business back then, I would have never thought that that business would go bankrupt. I think that they had around 150,000 employees globally. I think after bankruptcy, they came out of it because they had all these patents and stuff. But I think they only had around 150 or 200 employees. Like it was a, a shell of what it was, right? Um, and of course, repurposing. So this is that area. There was a whole bunch of buildings there. They've kept this building because it's got historic significance at the Kodak lands. They're repurposing it. It's going to be a station. Uh, in the new LRT. Again, that's good for construction. Highest and best use. You know what? From a construction point of view, you get changes that can give you other opportunities. So yeah, now we don't have this uh, heavy industrial work, but we definitely uh, have this infrastructure work that's going on there. So there's pluses to that, right? Um, there's pluses. And of course, uh, it was we. I could have had another set of images here with just a regular digital camera. I have a regular digital camera, but at a certain point, these iPhones and these uh, basically smartphones, uh, the camera technology keeps improving. So the first ones, yeah, it took pictures. That wasn't great. Well, the first digital cameras took pictures and they weren't great either. Uh, but slowly by slowly, they became better than film and easy to um, transmit and easy to use digitally. And so now, again, another device that is done other areas of business out. Not only did it do out the portable GPSs, or at least constrained it, it's also con extremely constrained uh, the camera sector as well, right? Uh, before, everybody would have a small separate digital camera that they would have for a period of time before these really took off. And of course, this had another big effect on phone smartphone makers like Nokia and... Um, uh, the BlackBerry. 
Kmart, another one of our clients. We used to do a lot of work for Kmart. We used to do a ton of work for Kmart, renovating their stores. Uh, Sears closed recently. Um, Walmart obviously uh, did a fantastic job on um, site logistics. And really, uh, it took a while. You know, you read the, the story of uh, Sam Walton and how he developed uh, Walmart. It took a while for that flywheel to really generate steam and, and power. But really, when it got going, uh, it became quite the, the force. And you know what? Like every business, they've got to watch it. They've got to watch it because if they don't, there's Amazon, right? And Amazon has really sort of, and then you've got these changes that have occurred like a pandemic and people not wanting to go in stores for a period of time. You really have to adapt and uh, adopt to change. So um, uh, companies then when they've got a certain structure, it becomes more challenging to adapt and to change. And if you wait too long, it's the Kodak example. Same thing in construction. If you're a laggard and there's other technologies taking over, building information modeling, there are jobs in construction that did not exist uh, 10 years ago. I remember I was at a conference in 1996. It was in Beijing, China, and they talked about the virtual constructor. I was lucky if I could open my uh, computer and print something. And they're talking about this virtual constructor, constructor integrating design, integrating estimates, integrating schedules, uh, building a database and having all of this information uh, combining and having high levels of prefabrication. And it just seemed to be like this dream out into the future. Well, you know what? The future is here. Uh, so you've got to be ready as a business to be able to um, adapt. So what does it really mean to you? As I was saying, you've got to be ready to adapt. Um, it's going to happen more quickly than in the past. It took a while for that technology to come up, even uh, the aspect of BIM, but it's going faster and faster. Uh, and you can be become obsolete or bankrupt as a business more quickly. You want to be in the upper 20% of your field. I want to be in that. I don't have to be in the 1%, but if I'm in the top 20%, top 20% is going to make 80% of the profits in the industry. So that's what you want to consider. It's the Pareto principle. You want to try to be in that, that top or upper echelon, 20, 30%. Uh, you don't want to be in the 40 or below. You want to be in that other zone. And you know what? Just because you get in that zone doesn't mean you stay in that zone. There's a book, uh, Jim Collins, that I'll quote often in this course uh, called Good to Great. Um, good to Great. Excellent book. I highly recommend it. And Good to Great, you know what? Doesn't mean great forever. So Good to Great is about companies that were really good, but how they became exceptional companies, right? How did they become great company? How did they become in that upper echelon? And um, you want to be in that upper echelon. The good thing is, you know what, in construction, there's a lot of not so great companies. So you just have to work it a bit. And I believe you can get there. Stay current in your field. Be aware of new opportunities while learning and using the tools that are timeless. Be committed to lifelong learning. Be efficient at learning to learn. Positioning. We'll talk about that in marketing too. Position your business with the tools necessary to master your field and craft while being resilient and adaptable to change. Improving personal and operational excellence. You've got to have really good systems in your business and you've got to have goals that you're targeting your business towards. And we'll talk about that. You want to make sure that you hire the best of people, adaptive, observant, and people that are self-motivated. It's much easier to motivate somebody and help keep them motivated than it is to try to motivate somebody who's demotivated or in the wrong business. With disruption comes opportunity. There's winners and losers. You can look for disruption and you can see in some cases who is going to be left behind, but you can also see where there's opportunities. So those are the things I wanted to cover in this module. And in module 1B, we're going to start talking about the types of businesses, sole proprietorship, partnership, and the corporation. So I'm Tom Stevenson. I hope you enjoyed this and I wish you a wonderful day. Bye for now.